My name is Ina, and I am uh, part of Regent Park Community, and I'd like to welcome you all because, to, you know, this is an important thing to become aware of our voting, um, our voting decisions and what, what our candidates stand for, and so I really um, applaud you all for coming today. Great. It's nice to get involved in our, in our voting process. I wish everybody would do this. Um, this this event today is hosted by the Community Civic Engagement Collaborative, and um, that is a group um, from Regent Park, Moss Park, and St. Jamestown that it's um, residents and it's also organizations in those areas, and we or we uh, try to organize a, around each elections, the federal, the municipal, and the provincial, and I believe this is our second uh, Provincial, or how how long? Our fourth? Your fourth? Okay, it's my second. It's their fourth. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, if anybody would like to become part of that, it's um it's a good group to yes, great. Um, I'd also like to just make lay some ground rules about um what we will uh, allow and what you know what you can do, what you can't do. Thank you. Um. Everyone that is participating in the event as a, a candidate or as an observer agrees to remain respectful of others in the room. Uh, zero tolerance will be um, for any abusive, racist, sexist, homophobic, etc. language. Zero tolerance. So um, as far as questions from the audience and from the people on Zoom or um, we do hold the same zero tolerance for any racial or sexual or abusive language, et cetera. So um, keep that in mind, and um, you will be asked to leave if that, if that happens. Um, please be respectful. Uh, the CCEC team will be monitoring the room and online crew to ensure participants are respecting each other and the candidates. Participants will be removed and participants will follow the guidelines. Um, question on question asking outlined by the moderators, online and in person. Great. Waleed, I forgot to mention you, and he is my co-host, and he's amazing. And he's going to read the land acknowledgment. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. We have a full house here. We've got 50 people over Zoom, and hopefully more will be joining us. My name is Walid Kogali Ali, and like my friend said, I'm going to be co-moderating tonight. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start off with a land acknowledgement, and after reflecting on the land acknowledgement, I'm going to go through, I think Ina went through the social contract already, so we're going to skip that. We're going to go through introductions and the rest of the program. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge that Toronto is built upon the traditional lands of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendats, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and many other indigenous peoples, and that these peoples have been the steward of the land in Toronto and across Turtle Island for thousands of years. It's important to acknowledge the history of the land that we are on, to stop and think about how the lands that we use today have supported and nourished other nations, other people, before we came to use them. We must acknowledge that we now benefit from the land, and learn how we may continue to respect the histories and steward the land. I'd like to acknowledge that Canada is founded on white supremacy as a trade and commerce economy that continues to affect the lives and well-being of indigenous people, putting economic greed in front of indigenous rights. The understanding and acknowledgement of the peoples that came before is particularly relevant here in our community of Regent Park as it has been home to indigenous peoples from time immemorial, but it has also been home to waves of tight-knit communities for more than 100 years. Regent Park's history in, uh, and our communities, surrounding communities like Moss Park and St. Jamestown, include multiple efforts to tear down and rebuild with each iteration of the neighborhood, washing away the connections to the people, lives, and communities that were here before. 
As a richly diverse community, displacement is something that many region parkers feel deeply as part of their history of the land and part of their own histories as newcomers, descendants of the transatlantic slave trade and other forms of imperialism, and as community members that have called Regent Park home before and during the most recent period of revitalization. Regent Park's history includes multiple efforts to tear down um, and rebuild with each iteration, no, th sorry, the collective has been organized, has organized this event, and this collective actually uh, respects the indigenous cultural worldview that is based in kinship, taking care of our community, the people and the land, and sharing what we have with those around us. The process of revitalization here in Regent Park offers an opportunity through social development plans like the one in Regent Park to honor the histories of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, as well as peoples that have called Regent Park home over the last century, and to preserve the spirit of community, neighborliness, and advocacy that has been so vibrant within our community. So we are here tonight to acknowledge that, and I want to, first of all, thank our amazing candidates from three political parties, the Liberal Party, the New Democratic Party, and the Green Party. So I'd like to, first of all, start off with the first candidate, Councillor Christine Wongtown from the NDP. So, Councillor, do you want to say quickly hi to everyone? Hi, Walid, and hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me at the back of the room? Now, Walid, I just want to verify, is this now the introduction? We're now going to start off with the introductions. You've got five minutes. Uh, and then what I'm going to quickly do before we get started off with introductions is just run through what's going to happen, right? Which is we're going to have opening statements from our candidates. So all three candidates will have an opportunity to start off with their opening statements. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get questions. So uh, questions that have been submitted in advance of this all candidates debate. We're going to take those questions first. Uh, each candidate is going to get about 1.5 minutes to answer every question. Uh, and then after that, we're going to take questions from the audience, especially from all of you that showed up tonight and from our friends who've joined over uh, the, the meeting via Zoom. So we're also going to take questions from the audience. And then we're going to get some closing remarks. Uh, and then we're going to get some closing remarks from the moderators as well and uh, some last-minute announcements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a quick introduction of all our three candidates, and then I'm gonna come back to Councillor Wang Tam, now candidate uh, for the NDP, Christine Wang Tam, to start us off, okay? So um, I'm gonna quickly introduce our three candidates again. From the NDP, New Democratic Party, Christine Wang Tam. From the Liberal Party, David Morris. And from the Green Party, Nick Ward. It's actually Nikki. Nikki Ward, okay. A round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And candidate uh, Christine Wong Tan from the NDP, you've got the first opportunity uh, to uh, start off your opening statement. Thank you very much, Waleed. And I, I know that you, uh, you called me a counselor. Uh, for all those who've been following, you know that I've, I've left City Hall about a week ago uh, to run in this provincial election. And thank you very much to everybody who's here for taking some time from your busy evenings to join us today. And of course, to the organizers, I recognize that uh, it is oftentimes a very limited time with your family. So you being here uh, either in person or online to join us is deeply appreciated. Um, this conversation that we're going to have tonight is so critically important, and I want to just sort of, I gave, I gave it some thought about what I could say, uh, especially since many of you may have, may know me already as the local counselor, um, but I thought it'd be important for me to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name, of course, is Kristen Wong Tam, and uh, I have um, uh, spent most of my life uh, in Toronto Centre, the majority of it, I would say, uh, largely um, uh, living here and investing and, of course, working in this community. And my story in Canada actually begins, uh, I'm going to date myself, uh, 1975, uh, when my family first immigrated uh, from abroad. My mom and dad uh, packed up two, four suitcases and, and two of their daughters, and they came here. And we settled into this neighborhood in Regent Park 
in the uh, older uh, buildings on Girard Street, what was now known as Phase 4 and 5, but to me it was actually a home. And, uh, and I actually really love this neighborhood, largely because first impressions are so critical, especially when you're a newcomer. And, uh, and I have learned through the years, especially watching my mom and dad work so hard, that it really makes a big difference where you can give back to your community, but also recognizing the remarkable gifts that Canada gave us as immigrants to this, fam to this uh, incredible country. Uh, it is so incredibly important uh, that we all recognize the roots that uh, we share, and each of us share those roots. Uh, it's not just myself as a, as a newcomer necessarily, from the 1970s, but you know, I want to pay also tribute to other candidates who are here. It takes uh, a lot of conviction and, of course, courage to stand for public office. And I want to tip my hat to both Nikki and uh, and David for their contributions for this dialogue, because uh, I know we're all trying to serve our community. Um, I will tell you um, a couple of quick things about me. Um, Many of you will probably know that not just am I a, a former city councillor, uh, that it's not just necessarily that I grew up here in Regent Park. I learned to speak English uh, up the street at the Spruce Court Public School, um, but I've actually built my entire life in trying to give back to my local community, which is why I actually ran for city uh, council in the first place. I wanted so desperately to give back to the country that gave us every single opportunity to be successful. And I learned many things. I learned to be proud of the work that we did together as community collaborators. I worked uh, very much in hand with you uh, in sync to build the neighborhoods that we wanted to build. I also learned that there were some certain limitations that city council just couldn't reach every single problem that we face as a society and over the past two and a half years those social inequities really magnify itself more than ever before because of the COVID pandemic. So I'm actually running for um, provincial parliament largely because of the conversations I've had with this community over those years about what we needed from a provincial government to help us become even more successful. Mental health, housing, uh, low wage employment, precarity around work, transportation, infrastructure, climate change, a lot of those things are out of reach from the uh, municipal government, but within the purview, the legislative purview at the provincial government. Can you imagine what Toronto and Toronto Centre could be if we had a provincial government that really supported downtown Toronto residents? So it's because of you and those conversations that we've had over the years that I'm actually seeking public office now at Queen's Park. I'll end off with this. Um, during my time at City Council, I've had the opportunity to meet and work with some of the most extraordinary political leaders from across the political spectrum. In 2018, um, the, uh, the premier at that time, um, the liberal premier, took me out to dinner and, and invited me to run for the Liberal Party. And as much respect as I have for her, I chose not to because my values are new democratic values. I believe in the party, I believe in the platform that the new Democrats are providing, and I believe in the solutions that we have for the problems that we have today. And that's why I've chosen to run for the NDP. And thank you very much, Waleed, for the opportunity to open this discussion. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. We're now gonna have uh, David go next, and then uh, Nikki. Just wanted to let folks know we were supposed to have another order, but it's all good. Uh, so, David, you ready? Yes, uh, Go just want to check, is this good enough from a sound perspective? Uh, is this close enough? Can folks hear me online? Okay, wonderful. Uh, I first of all want to start off by thanking as well the organizers, the CCEC, uh, community engagement, discussion around politics is absolutely critical. And so thank you for your efforts to bring us together. I want to acknowledge my candidates. I know them both and I've known them both for many years. Uh, we are all committed to public servants. And so this should be a very interesting conversation as we, we talk about our different visions, but I think our shared values of, uh, of duty and effort for our constituents here in Toronto Centre. Um, I look around the room and I see so many faces that I know that I've gotten to work with over these past few years, uh, especially through this COVID-19 pandemic, as we've worked together around providing food and meals to folks through organizations like Healing as One or Fred Victor, uh, I've worked with the Friends of Regent Park here, where we've gone through community cleanups and we cleaned our gardens together, picking up cigarette butts. 
And you know, we have major changes coming to this uh, riding, to this community very soon with things like phases four and five uh, of the Regent Park redevelopment coming, as well as the Ontario line. And so it's so amazing to look out and see folks that I've been working with uh, in this community uh, for so long. So that's great. I want to start off by talking uh, and introducing a little bit about myself. So I've lived here in the city for just over uh, 15 years now, uh, and this has been my home. But I came from small town Ontario, where my mom was a, sm uh, a small business owner. She had a gym which was focused on the physical and mental health of women. Uh, and my father was a longtime municipal councillor, uh, serving four terms uh, in the place where I grew up. And what they taught me was that a life in service of your neighbour was a life well spent. And that was values that they intrinsically passed on to me every day as I grew up in that household. And I embraced those values and dedicated my life to a career in public service, where I worked for the Ontario government for just under a decade, uh, particularly in planning how we deliver dementia services in this province, which is a condition that is on its rise in prevalence and affecting more and more of our seniors. Uh, and so it's absolutely critical that we get that right. So I was proud of the work that I did there. It also led me to get involved in this community. Um, I was the chair of the 519 for just over five years. That's a community center located here in our riding where we focus on issues like affordable housing, access to services, food security, I was also the vice chair of the People with AIDS Foundation, which focused on issues like medication and advocacy for those people that are living with HIV and AIDS, and also providing a food bank that really restores dignity when accessing food for those users. This is what I built uh, as a career, both professionally and in my spare time. It is what kept me going and kept me driving. And it also is what made me appreciate the role that government plays, that when we are facing issues like challenges in paying for our grocery bills, that government should step in. When we are seeing our students fall further and further behind in school, that government needs to step up and help support our kids. When we're facing a climate crisis that threatens our very way of life, that we need a government that will step in. And that's why I decided to run with the Ontario Liberal Party. I believe we are the team that is that government ready to step in while we've seen Ford step back as our premier. Day in, day out through this pandemic in particular, he left the people of Ontario uh, on their own uh, without any support. And you know, I, we three are here. It is interesting to note that the PC party is not here. I think that's a metaphor for they are stepping back from accountability. And so I am committed to being a part of the team that is going to put forward a positive vision for Ontario, a positive vision for Toronto Centre. And I am super thrilled to be here. Thank you all for your time. I have a silly question. No, no, I haven't started yet. Where are the Zoom people? There are a lot of cameras here, and I don't know who I should be looking at. The Zoom people up there. Oh, that's good. You won't catch my chins. That's nice. Thank you. OK. Carry on. Ready when you are. Oh, OK. 35 years ago, I came to Toronto on a business trip. I looked out of the window on a beautiful sunny day and I fell in love, hard. I fell in love with Toronto Centre. It had everything I valued about when I grew up in Northwest London, small, livable, walking community. It had all the things I'd gone looking for in the United States, uh, the hustle, the, uh, the sense of can do, that anything is possible, the economic vibrancy, and I knew absolutely knew in that moment that this is where I wanted to live, had to live. It wasn't a question. 35 years later, that love, and I know it's going to sound corny, but I don't care, that love is still as strong and as passionate as ever, if not more so. I came to Toronto Center as a business person with considerable privilege at the time. And then I came out, and then things changed. And I joke, because I make jokes easily, but many uh, a true word said in jest, I joke that that's when I learned humility. That's when I learned what it is to become a second or even a third class citizen. That's when I learned when it was where somebody could deny you housing, not based on what you did, but who they thought you were, what you were. 
That's where I learned my family could be taken away by provincial legislation so that I didn't have access or an opportunity to grow up and give my children the benefit of the many lessons I'd been proud to learn growing up. To say I love Toronto Centre is a profound understatement because when I came out, I lost everything. Nobody. I came here as this high-flying business person and nobody would hire me. I came here with money in my pocket and nobody would rent to me, except in Toronto Centre, here in Toronto Centre. It's the only place where what I am was not seen as a disadvantage, but an asset, it's treasured, that living authentically was not only possible here in Toronto Centre, but absolutely welcomed. I got a home, a real home. I didn't have to pretend that somebody else signed my lease for me. I got a job, real job, working with Fab Magazine. Not a real magazine, but a real job. <laughs> a wonderful, fluffy, effervescent gay men's magazine. And they recognized that I, as a trans person, was a huge asset. Not just because I'm easy to talk to, but because they would open doors that they previously hadn't been able to open. I volunteered at the 519. 25 years ago, and I brought my children all the way from St. Catharines to the playground in the back, to the playground in the back, so they could go somewhere and play with kids. And it's just not a big a deal about who or what I was. I was never allowed to see my kids go to see their own plays. But here in Toronto Center at the back of the 519 where I volunteered for 25 years, I was able to enjoy the simple pleasure of sharing the swings with my kids. Toronto Center isn't just special. It's unique. It's marvelous. It's brilliant. It's so filled with opportunity. It is almost, almost the ideal, ideal place. It should be the place that New York looks, looks to, for an example. We shouldn't be looking at New York. They should be looking at us. This is livable walkable community that everybody is talking about, we've actually got that here. And with a few changes, we can expand on that and model better behavior. I ended up serving on the board of directors as one of the first trans women ever to do so because I'd been volunteering there for many, many years, engaging in education in shelter systems around here and elsewhere. And I realized and I was doing a presentation, they said, you know, we don't even have a director here that's a trans woman. And so I said, oh, I open my mouth, I better step up and show up. Throughout all this, my family back in the UK has been enormously uh, supportive. And my mother taught me one thing. You're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. I love, I know many of you here, you know that I'm speaking the language of the heart here. This isn't politic or partisanship. You know that I've stepped up in difficult circumstances, often where I as a trans person was not welcome, but have stood up, showed up, and advocated on, the past, on behalf of people who did not have a voice. I not only love this wonderful, wonderful area, I have a duty to preserve it, to fight for it, and I'm not about to give that up anytime soon. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Thanks to all the candidates. What passionate opening statements we heard from our amazing three candidates uh, that are here with us tonight for a debate on the issues, a debate on the issues, okay? So we're gonna get started uh, with the first round of questions. Uh, and these are questions that were pre-submitted in advance of the debate uh, by many members of our community that wanted to hear from the candidates on four major themes, okay? And I'm gonna make sure we take questions from the audience as well, okay? So the four areas that we're going to be talking about is employment, housing, the environment, and income security. So this is the four primary questions that we're going to be hearing from our candidates. So the first question is going to go to Nikki. Ready? Okay. So the question, question number one, and it's focused on employment. What would you 
annual party due to ensure that all workers have better working conditions. We are particularly interested in the following, the $10, uh, 10 permanent employer paid sick days, minimum wage of $20 an hour with supports uh, to control rising prices, changing laws to ensure worker rights are protected in areas such as misclassification, firing, wage parity between contract, part-time, and full-time, or other areas. So those are some hints, but the question are, what will you and your party do to ensure all workers have better working conditions? And we're per and go ahead. Okay, thank you, but that's a big question. Do I have an hour and a half to answer it? No. Uh, no, no. Uh, no. Leslie, you have a minute. A minute and a, a half. Minute, oh, that's plenty of time. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank Perfect. You. And a minute and a half on the topic of uh, employment. employment. Employment wages, okay. Well, let me uh, begin by saying we're probably going to say much of the same kind of things. From a social justice standpoint, we're all talking very much the same language. One of the great things about the Green Party of Ontario is uh, it's very similar to when I was growing up in the Green Movement in, uh, in the UK. The focus is on economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, and social sustainability. And without any one of those components, you don't have a sustainable solution. In uh, the last government, uh, we have been uh, punching above our weight. And Mike Schreiner and the Green Party of Ontario have been shifting the government of the day to become, shall we say, slightly more compassionate. We've convinced them that there is a new climate economy, which creates new jobs, mm -hmm. new full-time jobs, not gig economy jobs. We've convinced uh, Doug Ford that we need to have proper pay for personal support workers and, and nurses. Obviously, we're in opposition to capping those rates as it is right now. So we've been able to convince, not by partisanship, not by name calling, not by trading blows, but by convincing the government of the day and our partners in government as well, that this is economically and environmentally sustainable. Paying people a decent wage isn't a cost, it's an investment in mm -hmm. those people. That money is recycled in our economy uh, and put to good use. We have to stop thinking about this as an expense. As to the minimum wage, I think it's set too low. I think we need to start looking at the um, uh, far above the poverty level when we start uh, imagining our quality of life. So I think uh, we'll say here probably very much of the, uh, the same thing from my partners here. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. David, you're next. Absolutely. Like, I think if you look at the parties that are here uh, up on this stage, we argued for over 400 days with this government that they needed to institute 10 paid sick days. We got three. Uh, we, as the Ontario Liberals, are committed to 10 paid sick days for Ontarian workers. We are committed to ending gig work for real work. If you are doing real work, you, will be, you should be seen as an employee of that business and treated as such. Mm -hmm. And we will end that. Uh, we are committed to creating a portable workplace benefit that you can take with you from workplace to workplace that will give you access to pharmacare, dental care, mental health care, critical services. But most importantly of all, as we've seen Ford hold back minimum wage at a time when people were struggling, we are committed to moving from a minimum wage to a regionally adjusted living wage for this province, which in the city of Toronto today looks like $22 an hour. So we've got a long road to get there, but we will get there and we will make that happen here in Ontario. Well said. Kristen? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, is my microphone on? Yes, it is now. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. It's so critically important. I've learned through the years of watching my parents work their, their hands almost to the bones and now they're arthritic, um, especially since we were growing up in poverty. Um, that it was so critically important for, uh, for workers to earn that decent living wage, which my parents never did. Now, dad is now 84. My mom is 74. They've never been able to even make minimum wage, uh, oftentimes as contract workers and gig workers themselves. Um, the, 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 the issue that, that really is plaguing our community here in Toronto Centre is oftentimes one that's uh, wrapped around poverty and government policies that have failed them from successive 
provincial governments that have not risen the minimum wage. And of course, the new Democratic government has said that right off the bat, we are heading to the $20 an hour minimum wage starting as soon as possible with a $1 predictable increase every single year so we can get there. We have already committed since 2018 $10 a paid sick day that was never negotiated. That was always just on the table. It was just assumed that's something a new Democratic Party would do. The other thing, of course, of is the miscalculation of assuming people that are gig workers are going to be independent contractors. We've got to close the loophole to make sure that we can get rid of that because bad bosses and uh, predatory bosses have got to be held to account, which they've never been under the previous uh, governments. And the New Democratic Party will certainly address that. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, now we're going to move on uh, to the second question. And it's an important question. Uh, I know a lot of people have submitted so many similar questions on the same topic, which is, surprise, surprise, housing. Surprise, surprise. So the question is, what will you and your party do to ensure broad access to safe, stable, and affordable housing for people who live at various income levels, including the lowest income? We are specifically interested in rent geared to income, portable housing benefit, and rent to own models. Rent to own models. So the first person that's going to go is Kristen. You go first. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Waleed, again for that question. It's so critically important. It's something that we're talking about at every single conversation, whether it's a dinner table or across the, the doorstep. Uh, obviously, you know, the New Democratic Party, and I'm actually really deeply personally connected to this uh, because I grew up in social housing. Like, these are the buildings I grew up in. I was a tenant of social housing. So we want to be able to build um, housing uh, across Ontario and build across the spectrum. But when it comes to the deeply affordable housing, the New Democratic Party, our platform is very clear. We lay out 311,000 portable subsidies that will allow people to take them where they need to go so that they can choose to live independently. Uh, and that is critically important. It's going to keep people from falling into homelessness, but also give people a chance to rise and go onto the pathway to independent recovery. The New Democratic Party is also going to be uh, building 250,000 new units across 10 years. And this is critical because this actually wipes out the, uh, the social housing wait list of RGI units as well as non-market units. And that that is a commitment of the party that's going to go back into building public housing, which of course has been abandoned by, which has been abandoned by by the pro provincial governments now for decades. Perfect. Uh, next we have. Um, it's gonna be one of us. One of us. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next um, actual person is David. Oh, Nikki. Nikki, oh, Nikki, Nikki, then David. The Nikki, then David. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, let's be serious for a second. Uh, we're in Regents Park area, which used to have RGTI. And we're looking out a window at a lot of condos. We're not looking out the window at a lot of RGTI. That's the fact. Condos were supposed to be a rent to own or a way for uh, people to enter the home ownership marketplace. That did not happen. We have a situation in Toronto Centre where we have more buildings, more very, very, very tall buildings, more condos, and yet less housing. That is wrong, and it is not just because of the provincial government. Of course, they've got a part to play as well. The biggest landlord in Toronto is Toronto. That stock and trade is being mismanaged. On a, party le on a local level, we've got to fix that by a variety of methods. But at the provincial level with the Greens, we've got a clear plan to introduce what we call participatory housing. That means cooperative housing. That is kind of like a, a, a rental on mod. It's not quite the same, but you are a member. I'm a member of City Park Co-op. It's an amazing way of rapidly bringing in uh, lower income housing right now, taking the stock in trade that the city of Toronto can now not adequately manage and turning it over to co-op use. That's an immediate fix, not a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year fix. 
We're still waiting for the original rent-to-gear income housing in this very neighborhood to be replaced. We've got five and a half thousand condos. We still haven't replaced the 2,000 RGTI spaces. That's mismatched priorities to me. Well said. Uh, David? Yeah, I will just say that in my view, and I've knocked on thousands of doors in this campaign, there is no greater issue facing this riding than affordability of housing. It, it is creating so much pressure on families. It is creating, uh, you know, challenges around homelessness in this community. And uh, I think absolutely this should be the top thing you look at when making your decision about who to vote for. And I am incredibly proud of our plan uh, as the Ontario Liberal team. I actually worked on it myself. I was one of Stephen Del Duca's housing advisors. And it is, I think, one of the most comprehensive plans. But speaking to specifically some of the issues that you've brought up, uh, we are committed to setting up a legal framework for rent to own here in this province to make that a reality. Uh, today in Regent Park, only 17 families have successfully entered into the rent to own uh, program, which I think is uh, like an absolute shame that we haven't seen more. We also have not, uh, you know, we're seeing phases four and five come with a thousand more units than what we were expecting, but no more RGI units. What we are planning on doing as the Ontario Liberal Party is setting up an Ontario Home Building Corporation with a budget of 15 billion over 10 years that will build 133,000 affordable, deeply affordable homes for this province. Uh, and that is uh, another plank in our plan that I'm very thrilled with. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm gonna invite my good friend, Ina. Ina is gonna be raising the next two important uh, questions uh, that were pre-submitted. Ina, you got it? Yes, Come on. Okay, the next question has to do with our environment. And we would like to know what um, your party will be doing to ensure that um, our environment is taken care of. What's and the order? Um, we're gonna go with Nikki, you're first. I've been first already. It's probably me that's first. Okay, David, Kristen, Nikki. Okay, David. Then. No worries, no worries, no worries. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure to go first. Happy to do so. Uh, we, I think, all recognize, all three parties here on this stage would uh, clearly recognize we are in a climate crisis. And there are definitely actions that a provincial government, as Kristen alluded to earlier, that we must take. Uh, we are talking about, as the Ontario Liberals, uh, ending the use of fossil fuels in the production of our energy here in this province. We're committed to reducing 50% of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero in this province by 2050 as a, a party. We're gonna plant 800 million new trees. We're gonna bring in Bucca Ride Transit, take 400,000 cars off our road every single day. And we are going to expand the green belt, add five new provincial parks, which collectively will yield 30% of Ontario's land being protected in this province, setting up the sustainability that we need to forever uh, ensure our uh, climate future in this province, uh, and doing our part as part of a global fight. Thank you very much, Enid, for the question. I think it's the, it's the other big question really in the room, and oftentimes at every single conversation we're having, is the existential threat of climate change and the crisis that we're in, especially with extreme uh, weather change. Um, the, the, the party is actually very much committed to fighting climate change, but also we're looking at it as an opportunity to also build millions of brand new green jobs, well-paying jobs, so we can transfer our economy into the future so it's much more sustainable than it is today. And of course, we're going to meet the, st the strictest requirements of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. This is critical. It's non-negotiable. We've got to bring the temperature of the globe down by at least 1.5 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, human, ex human uh, existence, as we know, it is going to radically change. But things that we can do practically on the ground that is actually doable and, and realistic and achievable, of course, means that we can also establish um, the world's most ambitious retrofit uh, program, which currently doesn't exist, uh, and especially not in Ontario when we haven't seen those opportunities built out. Um, that means that we can move 5% of every single new building that's being built and have it retrofitted. New buildings will have to meet the net zero requirement. We move to um, building and planting, sorry, planting at least a billion new trees over the next decade. And we'll do that with the city of Toronto as well, because you can see that we can do some additional support and help 
And then finally, when it comes to uh, being able to move things along when it comes to transit, the new Democratic Party, uh, the, new, the NDP has actually committed to putting 50% of operating dollars back into the TTC, which is actually going to be a game changer for the commission, which has not okay. been done in generations. We're going to ask the fourth question, but before we get into the fourth question, are you ready with your answer? Hmm? Are you done with all answers? Oh, no, no I'd kind of like to talk about the environment. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a thing with us. <laughs> all righty, we good? Clearly, we have the most, uh, the best, the fully costed environmental plan, and we welcome, uh, as we've always welcomed, other parties to adopt it, not just the slogans, but the actual practice of it. That's why I'm running, because I like to see this plan put into action, not just be put on some marketing material. The fact of the matter is, here in Toronto Centre, this is our environment. It's not just polar bears on icebergs. It's people in the downtown core. And the biggest pollutants and the biggest contributors to the carbon footprint in downtown Toronto, surprise, surprise, are these buildings that have been built in ways that are hostile to the environment. Now, therein does lie an opportunity to fix the mistakes that have been made at the municipal and provincial level by putting these things up in the first place. But there are other things that we can do in the meantime and immediately to bring those rates down much, much more quickly. Ontario is a net importer of fossil fuels, for heaven's sakes, $28 billion a year imported, and when we make our own clean energy here. Take that $28 billion, use our domestically produced clean energy, and then Put it to fixing our local environment. Think globally, act locally. And we have the money to do that if we stop importing. $60 billion, much more aggressive and well-calculated uh, targets than have been previously proposed. I invite you to take a look, and I invite you to take a look too, and see how this plan, what we have here, compares. Fully costed, as I mentioned, economically sustainable. Not just pie-in-the-sky thinking, but hard numbers about how to do this environmentally sustainable in the sense that, hey, we all share this planet. I don't like my kids to grow up to be as old as I am right now. And socially sustainable because we're talking about, in the meantime, our quality of life, the air we breathe downtown, the fact that we need to use a puffer in the summer seasons may well be eliminated in our lifetime. If we get to work right now, we've got a plan to do it and we've got a way to pay for it. Excellent, excellent response. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you. Wow. Okay, so our final question is going to focus on income security. Okay, and the question is going to go uh, to uh, Kristen, and then after Kristen, it's going to go to Nikki and then David. Okay, so the question is what will you and your party do to ensure all Ontarians have income security? We're particularly interested in the $500 weekly minimum benefit for all including recipients of Ontario Works and the Ontario uh, Disability Support Program. Universal basic income, better supports for seniors, and other programs that indirectly improve Ontario's, Ontarians' income security. So, Kristen, you want to go? Uh, thank you very much for, for that another important question. I think it's, uh, it's critical for us to recognize that the social safety net, as we know it, has, has, is broken. The ODSB rates, the Ontario Works rates is far too low. It, it's legislative poverty. And what we've seen is governments actually not tinker with it. They haven't even thought about uh, reforming it. And only during the election time have they talk, started talking about doing something about it. The NDP platform includes doubling the rates of OW and ODSB in its second year and indexing it to the rate of inflation and also giving it an immediate 20% boost. This will remove people out of poverty once and for all. We will plan to do that as soon as possible. The other thing when it comes to uh, providing supports for, for seniors, uh, we've seen seniors uh, languish in many of their homes. We've seen them suffer in the mismanaged uh, uh, pandemic, especially when it comes to long-term care. 4,000 seniors have died during the pandemic. And they've died without the adequate number of per, uh, personal support workers or registered nurses. And the, and the NDP is planning to hire 10,000 PSWs and 60,000 nurses because we need to make sure that our seniors and anybody else who needs basic care is going to have what they need so they can age properly in place. This is not just a small tinkering. We're not just thinking out of the box. The NDP is smashing the box. We're planning to start all over. 
And that's what our communities need to here, especially in Toronto Center. We've seen it, you've seen it, everybody is, is struggling, and that's how we're gonna fix it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, for the purpose of this, um, I need to disclose that I am a person who lives with a disability. It's not overtly visible, but it is serious. And if there are any doctors in the room, I'd be glad to discuss it with them at a later stage. Um, uh, that's, that's making a, a joke out of something that's terribly serious. I know where the food banks are. Ask me how I know. I know how inadequate ODSP is. Ask me how I know. I know what RGTI is. Ask me how I know. And I also know that it is the Green Party that is going to double ODSP. I think you may want to re-examine the numbers there. We are talking about an overhaul of a system that is utterly broken. And again, we figured out how to pay for it. Making disability payments or social assistance payments based on the lowest common denominator is just wrong. It's wrong thinking. Putting everybody at or below the poverty line is, a, uh, is the opposite of a rising tide. It's a lowering tide. We're looking at the low income cutoff, which is another magic number, which brings everybody up to the right standard of living. How do we pay for that? Well, OW, ODSB, the trillion benefit, are all managed entirely separately and entirely wastefully. Our commitment is to double ODSP. And by the way, in government, we've already managed to convince Doug Ford that it's a good idea to move it in one particular direction. Not far enough, admittedly, but it shows you how we fight, we punch above our weight. I uh, would, again, I know that I was at a debate last night, and I encourage you to look it up because we went into this in much greater detail. But talking about uh, disability income in terms of poverty is wrong thinking. It's not a poverty issue, it's a survival issue. And it has to change now. Not five years, not 20%, now. Yeah, yeah so uh, we as the Ontario Liberal Party are definitely looking at uh, rate increases as well. They are 20%, which the NDP came out with initially, have recently moved to matching the Green Party's position. That's a good idea. And I want to say very clearly that we are not done. I am not done, personally. Uh, as, as your representative, if I go on to be elected, in talking about rate increases, we, I will not rest on that number. Uh, but what I will say is that also you look at our package that we are offering in this election globally, $1 of fair transit, including wheel trans, taking the HST off the cost of prepared foods, uh, investing in a, like deeply affordable housing. There are other actions that we are committing to in this election that will make a difference and a positive impact for those folks that are on ODSB and Ontario Works. For seniors, we're going to increase their pensions by $1,000 per year in their OAS for those seniors that need it the most. And we are providing a home care guarantee that if you want home care first, that is what you should have. It is the largest investment in home care in Ontario's history that we are putting forward. We are hiring 100,000 healthcare workers as part of this plan, and we're gonna pay our PSWs 25 bucks an hour to thank them for the great work that they do every day. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, now we're gonna take some questions from our audience. Did everybody so, hear that? <laughs> if I can summarize the question as best I can, it's, you know, what are we going to do for our kids in education, uh, including, you know, uh, you know, investing in our local schools is kind of the question that I've understood and under uh, advocating for the local community around our local schools. So that's, that's a good summary of the question, folks think. Uh, I don't know who goes first. I guess it's you. It's you. Yeah, is yeah, it me? Yeah. Oh, I thought you knew yeah. this now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, my pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, absolutely, what we've seen in in this board government, I've talked to a lot of teachers, I've talked to a lot of students, and you know, one of the things that's really broken my heart uh, is that many schools have had to give up their guidance counselors. One of the first things that gets uh, cut. And I remember how important my guidance counselor was for me uh, when I went to school uh, in helping me figure out what did I want to do? How was I going to apply to schools? And which university did I want to go to? And I am heartbroken that resources like that have been taken away from our schools. 
So we are committed to bringing that back and adding thousands of healthcare professionals to our school, or not healthcare professionals, sorry, thousands of professionals like librarians, like guidance counselors, like mental health workers. We're going to reduce and cap our class sizes at 20, not an average of 20, a cap of 20 by hiring 10,000 new teachers. Um, we are also going to uh, cancel the 413 and use that money to clear the repair backlog that we have in our schools because under the Liberal government we built more schools than we've ever built before but now we do have a job to maintain them so we're gonna get that done. Yeah I heard an entirely different question. Uh, yeah, I the, question I, the question I heard was what are you gonna do about it not what are you gonna promise. I heard somebody who was frustrated with uh, low-income low income kids here with nothing to do uh, and, uh, and in jeopardy. I heard somebody that was concerned about the future of kids who were not being treated well right here in Toronto Centre. I heard somebody was frustrated and with what we can see right outside of this window right here, but you can't see at home. That's what I heard. One of the good things about the Green Party of Ontario is that we don't take shots at parties much as they might deserve it. They, uh, uh, what we do is we do work across party lines. In the event of a coalition, we'll work with the Liberals and the NDP. We'll provide the moral compass, of course, but we'll work with them. But we've proven we can also work with people we don't particularly like. It's called being a grown-up, and we all have to do it sometimes. And we've proven that we can shift towards thinking in the right direction. The other thing that's great here in Toronto Centre is that when you elect the Green Party of Ontario, Nikki Ward specifically right here, you're electing somebody who is going to work for Toronto Centre, not follow the leadership, not quote party lines, but work first and foremost, their conscience, your conscience, right here in Toronto Centre. That means we get things done more quickly, more locally, and with greater action, not empty promises that there's no money for. Thank you. Uh, Ines, thank you so much for your question. And uh, I was actually thinking about my own son. Uh, who's, uh, who's three years old, and pretty soon he's going to be starting school off of Church Street Public School. Um, and he has, a, he has a developmental disability. And, and I think about, and I worry about him getting lost in the system and not having the adequate supports he needs, and what happens when we can't stay in the public school system when we have to move, and if that's even an option, because God knows, you know, it, schools are ex very expensive if you have to pay for additional supports. So this question that you asked is so deeply personal, and I think it's actually going to be um, answered in two ways. One is to invest in this in the community, so therefore we support the parents who are providing supports for their students, but also invest in the teachers and the education system so that you can actually have the actual adults and the caring adults in the classroom that can guide those kids to proper education and to pathways out of poverty and out of uh, the neighborhood uh, when it sometimes is, is rife with challenges. Um, and that is not going to be necessarily easy work, but we do this with community, we do this with investments in people and not just, and not just talking about it. The other thing, of course, is that we have to invest in the crumbling school system. We've had provincial, and I will say this, we've had provincial governments having opportunities to tackle the crumbling school system by, cha by, by changing the way the schools are funded, and they have never, ever done it. They've never allowed the education development um, uh, charges to be collected by the TDSB. Only the Catholic school system gets that and never has, but has the public school system re uh, received that, and, and we will change that. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ravi, I believe you're the next question. Uh, thank you so much for coming here, and thanks for everyone here. Uh, that's better. That's better. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I mean... So my question would be for housing, I guess, uh, many other newcomers who are really struggling in this crisis. And I feel, well, five, four years ago, I helped uh, Morris to get elected before for NDP, and we were able to paint it all orange. And she promised us many things. But she kept only two questions asking us, how are you and where do you live? And then never happened, something else happened. And... <laughs> So, and also like liberal, because I see as our government, this is the second time they got elected and there's nothing. So is there action, a plan you're gonna do? Like I heard you ask like, someone, I think previous, yeah, previous question, or ask it, but is there something 
you are planning really to start after you got elected to really start hit the ground and start right the way you have really action like plan is right there to do it so we can look for it or just promises promises and then we're going to wait for the for the other you know next election a next election so great question thank you so i guess just a little more detail on the housing issues yeah. that we're all facing great Kristen, yes Rabia, thank you so much for your question, and I really appreciate the, the conversations that we've had over the years, especially when it comes to families who have larger uh, needs, and that means you need to have apartments and homes that can actually uh, you know, give your children their individual bedrooms, and oftentimes what we're seeing is that we're not getting that built. Uh, but that will change, and that can change as long as the provincial government does step in, and this is something that's so critically important, because without provincial and federal support, we will not be able to see affordable housing that's built for families. It will be continued to be built for investors, and that's what we don't want to see. So having some controls to stop the flipping and stopping the land speculation is critical, but without those provincial and federal dollars, it won't work. So two things, immediately 31, 311,000 new portable subsidies will be produced uh, through the NDP if we form government. And, and I think it's important for us to, to recognize that without forming government, um, it can't be done. So, you know, to the point that, you know, perhaps uh, there was some uh, comments made about your previous MPP, she always sat in opposition. So she could not have been able to do any of those things because she was stopped every single step of the way by a, by a Ford government. And uh, of course, uh, that render, renders it very difficult. So if you are able to elect an NDP government, everything that's in our platform, including a Toronto platform that we just released, we will be able to deliver as long as we have the ability to uh, to uh, to move forward in government, and and that's critical. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. I'm almost speechless. Uh, the question asked was, "What are you going to do? Not what are you going to promise." The one young, the person we spoke there, and I think the other person is old enough to vote too, at least soon. Uh, one of the good things about the Green Party is we always kept our promises, even when we're in opposition. And to say that being in opposition means that you're not part of government is nonsense. I have fought for human rights at the constitutional level from a position of no legislative authority. We've got gender identity passed at the federal level, the most tough piece of legislation to be passed. And we did it from a position of physical weakness, but moral authority. So to hide behind the fact that you're not going to form the next government, which may well be the case, is is madness. And then to say that, that we can't be relying on developers, well, you, I don't know how that come out of your mouth. The fact of the matter is we don't need 311,000 promises. We need one home for that person. We have properties right now that are being mismanaged by the city of Toronto that could be made available for people in need. Instead of these vague, empty, partisan promises, I feel so sad That's, that 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 Suze, Suze wasn't able to run for reasons that are best known to her that I won't get into. But that's the problem when you have to do what the leader tells you to do instead of what the constituents tell you, demand that you do. Not empty promises, but homes that exist right now that just need to be retrofitted. This is not just the right thing to do. It's economically sustainable, environmentally and socially, by God, it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, as I, as I listened to the two responses and thought of your question, Rabia, um, you know, and my party of the three of us currently does have the best chance of forming government, but we may not either. And so I could quote to you our platform and I could lay out how that's going to help, but I also don't think that that's the right answer for you right now. I think that you're asking a human question of your human representative. Will you always, every single day, make this a priority to raise with the Ford government, to negotiate, to uh, advocate, to never stop bringing forward this concern. And I can simply tell you that I will, because as I've said at the beginning, affordable housing, access to housing, to me, as I've knocked on thousands of doors, is the number one issue in this riding. And so I don't know what it will look like if the Ford government uh, you know, makes government and what their plans will be for housing, but I will never ever stop bringing forward this issue for this community because I've just heard it from so many people, and now I've heard it tonight from you. So thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you to all our candidates. We're now going to move over to the Zoom, to our Zoom audience. We have a lot of people that joined over Zoom. So we're going to take two questions over Zoom. Ishmael, go ahead. Okay. Yep. We can hear you. Tamsa, thank you so much for your question. Um, you know, one of the things that is in the platform, and it's important to talk about the platform because it actually lays it out uh, for you what what it is you're you're deciding on. So it's not just a gimmick, and it's not a, it's not just promises. It's actually the roadmap. Um, so when it where they're going to be created. So when it comes to the Ontario line, which is a very expensive piece of transit infrastructure, uh, and all other Ontario infrastructure that we will be building, uh, the, the party is committed to actually tying it into a community benefits agreement. So we can actually track the jobs, know where they're going, understand where the money is coming, and also knowing that the money is going to stay locally in the hands of the local community, which I think is absolutely critical. Um, over the past year, I've actually been working with the Ford government, trying to ask them the same question. What are your plans for the Ontario line? What are your plans? when it comes to building the transit-oriented communities and how can we drive those communities' benefits right back in? And guess what the answer has been? Crickets. We have received no answer from the provincial government on what their community benefits agreement is, whether or not they're going to be meeting targets, especially hiring racialized uh, youth and, and young adults. Uh, we have heard absolutely nothing. And we've been asking them about financial benefits and, and, and incentives to make sure that businesses that are unduly impacted by 10 years of construction are Thank going you. to be compensated. And again, the answer has been nothing. So Thank we you. continue to push forward. And, and I did that as a city councillor without a seat Thank in, in uh, Queen's Park. Thank you. Nikki? Okay, this is a, a, a very, very, very good and very deep question. Thank you. The first part is that we've got all these construction jobs going on. Why aren't we getting the benefit? That's a bloody good question. There are people who come into my neighborhood to dig up the roads and then cover them over and then dig them up again and cover them over. Uh, and, but they don't live in our neighborhood. They will come in from out of town in the 905 and then go away and vote for Doug Ford. So that irks me. Let's put it that way. That irks me. But back to Metrolinks, why aren't we employing people more locally? That's a very good question and one that's well posed to a city councillor. The fact of the matter is we need to communicate with all levels of government and we cannot do it, as has been done in the past, by demonizing, throwing shade and doing the politician's gang sign was it's not my department, right? Fed up with it. It's nonsense. Metrolinks are difficult to deal with. They're a provincial body, but you can deal with them. There is no plan in place to ameliorate the traffic that's going to be completely clogged up while this construction goes on. Transportation, city transportation and provincial transportation have to work together, and that means being able to work with people you don't particularly like or you don't particularly agree with, and that hasn't happened, and that's why we're in this mess. Yeah. I have personally Thank myself 
uh, joined in meetings about the Moss Park Benefit Community Benefits Coalition, the Region Park Community Benefits Coalition, because I fundamentally believed in that work, uh, in the effort that you were doing as a community to uh, drive these developers, these builders, whether they be Metrolinx or private, to come to agreement. And that work must continue, and I would continue to champion it here locally. As we see Ontario Line coming to this riding, I have a lot of concerns about the future of businesses that will be deeply disrupted for many, many years. Yeah. I have questions about how they'll be compensated, and I will continue to ask those of the Ford government yeah. and fight on your behalf on this issue. You know, I have the other thing I see when I look at development proposals coming in is a lack of what I call neighborhood retail. Businesses that are actually uh, open and available for folks in the community not just franchises that we see taking over the best corporate leases because they can afford it. So I will raise this for you as long as I can as your MPP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question from Zoom. Is it myself? Okay. Um, so, um, is it clear what the, I'm sorry, I wasn't entirely clear on the question. We're talking about Moss Park community or Moss Park community specifically or supporting social in general? I believe it's a, a social development plan for Moss Park. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Well, uh, look, I've been involved in this. And as, as, um, one of the reasons I left the board of the 519 was because I thought some of the, uh, uh, top-down thinking was a little problematic around here. People in Moss Park, you know, nothing about us without us. And the people in Moss Park need to be making decisions about how Section 37, Section 38, and other developer givebacks are spent. That shouldn't be put in the hand of councillors or politicians in general. It should be put in the hands of people. Moss Park has turned into this huge, huge gold rush of development. And none of that gold is trickling down to you or me. I don't live in a condo. I don't live in a townhouse. I live in a city park co-op. And I'm proud to do that. But none of that money is trickling down to co-ops. None of that money is trickling down to social innovations like is going on in Moss Park. And that money should and must be spent for and by the people it was intended. I hope that's clear. That's the action. I won't bring it up. I will bring it into action. Kristen, anyone else? Uh, thank you very much for the, for the question. Um, you know, Building Roots is a very important organization in Moss Park, and I'm proud to have supported it uh, most recently uh, with the purchase of their second container. We'll be actually adding a new gazebo and other a few other community benefits, uh, which I think is actually what the community is looking for. Um, so when it comes to the social development plan, especially this one in Regent Park, I'm very proud of my role and contributions in making sure that it's adequately funded by the City of Toronto. Now there's a table, there's a staff person, and it's underway. We should do the same thing with the social development plan if Moss Park uh, was to reach to achieve one. The, the, the thing that triggered the Regent Park social development plan was revitalization. So being able to revitalize and initiate that with, with Regent Park, uh, sorry, with Moss Park uh, would be critical. But I would be very interested in understanding whether or not it could be done at the provincial level. So therefore, you know, the province, which has a lot of money, and of course, the provinces do direct where the growth goes, and let's not kid ourselves, the province has some significant reach when it comes to local planning and development. We should be able to work with, with, uh, with those tools that we have at the provincial level, so it's not just in Moss Park, but it's also going to reach our communities in St. Jamestown, and making sure that the social development plan is all that's been set that has set the pace for the rest of the city, including the TCHC revitalizations in Alexander Park and Lawrence Heights, that we can actually make those benefits flow 
beyond Regent Park, which of course was important, but make sure that it cuts right across the city in all those vitally, vitally important uh, uh, communities. Thank you. David? Yeah, um, first of all, uh, shout out to Mac and Dustin and all my friends at Building Roots. I have worked with you for the last two years uh, and have volunteered there. I love what you're doing and you play such a pivotal part of the Moss Parks Benefits Coalition there. So. Uh, shout out to the team. Shirley's here. Uh, uh, we volunteer together as well there. Uh, so definitely uh, appreciate uh, the importance of work you're doing. And as Kristen has alluded to, uh, the funding of a SPD um, for Moss Park is something that the province could do. But I, as a member of your provincial parliament, uh, you know, I may not sit as that minister. If I ever sat as that minister, uh, ever sat as minister. I can't say to you today that I will get that, like I will fund that, but I will say that I know the great work that you're trying to achieve with this uh, social development plan and that I appreciate the value of that and will amplify and echo that at Queen's Park as best I can. Thank you, David. So we're going to take uh, two other questions from the audience here. Um, I think Steve is the second uh, person who's going to, my friend here, you're going to ask your first question. Go ahead. What's your name, my friend? Shirley, Shirley, you want to come up here and ask your question? Come on up. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. I'll go with Kristen first and then answers. Okay, go ahead. Question first, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks for mentioning the Moss Park market. It's really important. We need a food hub in this area. There is great stuff up at Wellesley, but down here, I'm a social, I've been a social service worker, student, blah, blah, social, all that stuff. Okay, my real question is, it's kind of two-part. What is a specific plan to raise the rates for people on disability? It's, I, I, the last raise was, was it 2018, 2019 of like maybe 10 cents? People are really hungry here. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the whole province, I'm not just saying this. That, like, where is that cash going to come from? Because that's a hell of a lot of money, one. Two, just in case, the plan B, that we get what we've already had. The four-letter F word. What are we going to do? Because, like, you know, this is why I can see in this neighbor, people are screaming and yelling at three in the morning. It's, it's become very unhealthy. It's a poverty Big, po big time poverty. It's not just addictions. La 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 la. It's all, you know, it's all connected. So, you know, like how can we, where's the money going to come so that people can get enough to work on trying to improve, improve themselves? Not, ev not everyone's attached. Not everyone has family. My family is a million miles away in a different continent. We don't communicate. So. Well said, Shirley. So we'll go with Kristen first, and the question focuses on ODSB. What are you going to do about ODSB rates, and what are we going to do with the four-letter word? Uh, <laughs> I've actually worked with the four-letter word at uh, City Council for four years, and, uh, and I can tell you that it can be done. It's hard, but you have to put in the work, but it can certainly be done. Um, when it comes to ODSB, Shirley, thank you very much for your question. Um, it's actually... The, uh, the NDP is tying the two together with ODS, ODSP as well as Ontario work. So it's, it's important that we actually recognize that there is a form of poverty right now that it sits and it's legislated by the provincial government. And we have seen provincial governments not resolve this very uh, difficult structural defi deficiency. The, the NDP will raise the ODSP and Ontario Works Program by doubling the rates and indexing it to the rate of inflation and immediately give it a 20% boost. Just so, it, just so people understand what the numbers translate to, for ODSP, just for shorthand mathematics, it brings you to $2,495 in the second year. That is, a that is a commitment to lifting every single person in Ontario out of poverty. Um, there, I, I will speak to the passion uh, 
for, for a minute about uh, the about our leader, because I think it is important for us to take a look at who the leaders are of this party. And when it comes to when it comes to Andrea Horvat, she is deeply committed to siding on behalf of the of the workers. She is very committed to helping those who are most vulnerable and in need. And she's not interested in, in you know doing favors for buddies or insiders. That's who she is. And I'm very proud to be running on, on, on that ticket because it's so critically important. And this is the kind of leadership at Queen's Park that we need right here in Toronto Centre. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And David? Yep. As uh, we spoke about earlier when talking about this question, we are committed to 20% over two years and indexing deflation, uh, recognizing that more work and more conversations need to be had on rates. And I will not rest until those conversations are had and a successful outcome is achieved in our plan if we make government this June. Um, we are also going to bring back the universal basic income pilot because I do believe that that may be the future of how we may support our folks living in poverty in this province. And so we need to do that research, understand that work, and uh, effectively transition, uh, plan for a transition one day, hopefully, to a new system of supporting those who are most vulnerable in our community. In terms of how we're going to deal with the Ford problem, I agree with what Kristen's saying that, uh, you know, I will work as your representative wherever I can to advocate for you here locally. Uh, and I also believe, you know, when we lost in 2018, I jumped to work rebuilding this party, the Ontario Liberal Party, which, uh, you know, took quite a beating in that election. But that's because I believe that we were going to be the party to take on Ford. Uh, and I still believe that. I think we have got the leader to do that. And I'm going to work every day from now for the next 15 days, and if it doesn't happen this time, for the next four years, to make sure that a progressive government that comes back to Ontario will be a liberal government. Thank you, David. Nikki? Bob Ray, Mike Harris, Dalton McGinty, we've had one of each, and they've all messed up ODSP. Nobody's innocent in this one. The question I heard was, what are we going to do? No, we're going to promise. We have a coalition, it'll be fine. We'll work with the Liberals and the NDP, whoever gets elected, and the moral compass will be provided, and the smart ideas will be provided by hopefully Nikki Ward and the Green Party of Ontario. If we get a Ford government, we will do what we have already done, which is use advocacy, the power of persuasion to get change. How do we pay for this? You're right, it's expensive. In the past, I worked in the insurance industry. Specifically, I designed the health insurance plan for the Canadian Association of Retired Persons. When I say I designed, I didn't make the pretty brochure, I did the math. The fact, uh, built a program that was good for members and also profitable. And I can tell you that there is money in the Ontario uh, health insurance program to pay for this. ODSP is mismanaged to the tune of much of the money that we need. The fact of the matter is that investing in people with disabilities is just that. It's investing in us so that we can go out and be productive. No clawbacks when we try and go back out for other, uh, other work. This can be sold. The money is in there. Guess why? Because somebody who has a disability, who is out on the street, who can't eat nutritious food, is struggling with survival. And when you're hospitalized, my friends, it is much, much, much more expensive than a 20% sometime never promise. Thank you, Mickey. Okay, we're gonna have our next, wow, passionate, passionate remarks, thank you. We're gonna have our next uh, question from our audience. Steve, are you ready? Perfect, Steve, come on in. First of all, thank, thank you, the three of you, for coming and speaking with us tonight. Um, we've learned a lot of hard lessons the last couple of years, and one of them is with kids uh, being out of school and people working from home, it's the problem of the disparity of access to broadband internet mm -hmm. in the province. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people are going sitting outside the public library because the librarians are kind enough and smart enough to boost the Wi-Fi signal at night mm -hmm. just to get access. It's expensive. It's difficult. All these buildings here are wired for it. So what is your party going to do to give better access to everyone, especially uh, poorer neighborhoods and indigenous communities with good broadband internet access? Thanks. Excellent, excellent question. Uh, so I guess we're gonna get started off with David and then we'll go to Kristen and then Nikki. David, go ahead. 
Yeah, so I am immensely proud of Stephen's plan that we put forward for Ontario. I think it's incredibly imaginative, it's incredibly thoughtful, and I think that what I most appreciate is that we looked at the entire province of what we could do uh, for all of them around and across this province. And uh, speaking to that exact point, Stephen was one of the first leaders to come out and talk about broadband access across this province, making it available for folks that need it. Uh, and so we'll, uh, like the fact that he did it first, one of the first, uh, I can't say absolutely he was the first, but uh, one of the first uh, leaders to say that this was gonna be part of our plan it's not something that would have been thought of right away. It's not a slogan. It's not something that you can run on, but we know the importance that having access to internet, if you're trying to set up a small business, if you're trying to stay connected with family, how important that is. And so that's why we built it into our plan right out the get-go. Okay, excellent, Kristen. Uh, thank you. I, I, you know, I, I thank you for that question, Steve, because this is something that I have spent a lot of time uh, studying myself because I want to make sure that people have opportunities to be successful. Um, when I was a child growing up in Regent Park, it's actually the public services that gave me a chance to get out of poverty. It's actually the public libraries, the public recreation facilities, all those public services. And I actually believe that when it comes to Wi-Fi and internet, it's a, it's a basic right now. Even the United Nations has said that you have to be able to have access to Wi-Fi in order for you to have civic participation. And of course, even for the kids to do their homework, to pay your bills, and more and more seniors are being left behind because we're moving into that digital space. So when it comes to making sure that people don't be left, aren't left behind, the NDP platform actually has has a particular plan to make sure that we use the existing infrastructure that we have to leverage multiple functions and uses. So that means providing affordable uh, access uh, to uh, Wi-Fi and internet. It also means that we have to work with the federal partners to regulate telecoms, because right now, you, if you work with Rod, if you use Rogers or Bell, uh, chances are you are overpaying. And when it comes to making sure that we can actually, uh, that we can regulate, so therefore, just like in, in terms of gas, in terms of hydro, we have to be able to regulate it so it becomes affordable. And when it comes to provi provision of Wi-Fi in schools and, and the libraries and the recreation facilities and all these public spaces, including parks, that's where we need to go into the future. And, and, uh, and that's what is uh, particularly being discussed. And, uh, and we're interested in supporting and investing in that. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Nikki, what do you have to say? Well, with respect, the question wasn't about Wi-Fi. It was about broadband, uh, which is an entirely different thing. I think this is, it speaks to some of the issues, a lack of um, understanding of, uh, of technology. Broadband means fast, reliable, stable internet. Wi-Fi is something that you use in your house. Uh, it's nice that you can catch a Wi-Fi signal outside of a library, but that is making do with a bad situation. As I'd also point out that the, la the lines, whether they're resold through Rogers or through uh, Bell, they're all Bell telephone lines, which is part of the federal provincial uh, monopoly that we have on the plumbing to supply this. I do agree with one thing, though, uh, that housing is a right, education is a right, and access to services is a right. Yes, it's true, you can't set up a small business if you don't have good, stable, fast internet, but neither can you apply for employment benefits or education benefits, or housing benefits. And if you want to check your status on the waiting list, the long, long, long waiting list for uh, participatory housing, you need a connection. And if you need to change the information on, oh, where you want to live, that all has to be done online. The lack of broadband internet here and elsewhere and everywhere is a dis chief discriminator, uh, it's a discriminatory practice. People with uh, 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 less, fewer language skills, or money are not provided the same access to opportunity as everybody else. And there are laws against that. You're not allowed to discriminate on those bases, and yet the government is. And that's one of the angles to actually correct, make sure that people do the right thing, as well as the morally correct thing. Thank you, Nikki. Um, we're gonna now take two more questions over Zoom. So let's see if our friends over Zoom are ready. Yes, I can hear you, Kais. Go ahead. <laughs> so our next question is actually around um, overdose prevention, uh, so the opioid crisis. Um, so we have a question, uh, what is actually happening with overdose prevention sites and the lack of support um, that we are seeing 
uh, uh, city for people who are homeless um, or not being allowed to stay in parks um, as you know, housing and you know, shelters are not full. We need to, so the question is basically what are our actions around sort of the opioid crisis and support for our neighbors um, in tents um, uh, with all the evictions that are going on. Um, what is the uh, uh, opinions of the candidates regarding this issue? Thank you, guys. An excellent question. So this question is going to go first to Nikki, and then Nikki, then Kristen, then David. So overdose crisis is the other pandemic. So who's going to first? It's going to go to you first. Nikki. Right. Nikki. Okay. Ready. Thanks. Okay. Um, so the the question is, we have an overdose crisis in our province. What steps are you going to take to make sure that we address this crisis meaningfully? It's that as it's known as the other pandemic. Go ahead. I, I, I did this. Thank you. Uh, in the Green Party, we call this opioid poisoning. People are being poisoned by this drug. They're being poisoned by the fact that there's no access to safe supplies. Being poisoned by the fact that uh, it's criminalized behavior, where most often it's a, just a desire to cope with the pain of living in poverty or with mental health issues that have been unaddressed. What are we doing about it? Clearly not enough. People are dying more now than they were before, right? So whatever is being done right now is not working. We know that much. We're talking about, number one, decriminalization. So we take this out of the hands of the cops and put it in the hands of health and social workers where it properly belongs. Number two, we're talking about making sure there is a safe supply so people aren't poisoned. Okay, some people maybe overdose inadvertently, but many more are being poisoned. And this is murder. Why aren't there more murder investigations here? That's a, very, that's a question I'd like to see answered. We're talking about safer injection sites, and we're talking about fast-tracking access to treatment, if that's an option for you. And finally, when it comes to supportive housing, for those people who are trying to get clean and sober, we need safe space for them too, because it's impossible to get clean in a madhouse that is a shelter that's trying to accommodate everybody and not supporting anybody. That's what we're going to do. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Kristen? Um, thank you very much for that question. And it's also another one that's deeply personal, especially since Toronto Centre, the downtown east, uh, we are at the, at the epicenter of the opiate crisis in Ontario. Um, and, uh, and it's one that actually has, uh, has I think, left many of us uh, emotionally just uh, scarred uh, based on the fact that we've seen our neighbours fall ill or perhaps just you know, fall down in front of us. Die. You know, so when it comes to treating it as what it is, I think we need to be able to tie it together. We can't talk about the opiate crisis without talking about the mental health crisis. And these two are in intricately connected, opiates, uh, sorry, uh, mental health and addictions. The, the NDP would actually begin by declaring the opiate crisis a public health emergency. You saw how quickly we were able to mobilize all orders of government when we decided that we were going to battle COVID-19. No expense was spared and every life was valuable. We would do exactly the same thing with that by number one, naming it, and then mobilizing the three orders of government to act as quickly as possible to make sure we invest in harm reduction strategies, working towards safe supply, building the rehabilitation facilities and the detox facilities so that people can have a pathway to recovery, which is what they cannot have right now. You can't get a crisis bed, you can't get a, a detox bed in this city or anywhere in Ontario, to be quite honest, at this point in time because previous governments and this existing government under the Ford government has actually walked away and ignored this problem and it's grown massively under his watch. David? Yeah, I would not fully agree with the statement that previous governments walked away from this problem. You know, the Kathleen Wynne government was the government that stepped up to this problem and that worked with the federal government to get our first supervised injection sites set up in this riding and in this province. So I, I don't quite agree with that statement. I also call it, uh, myself, uh, a drug poisoning uh, crisis, because that's what this is. And it is also deeply personal, as I've lost friends to this uh, crisis. This isn't strangers. This isn't people that are faceless, that aren't, uh, don't have names. They are people in our community. They are our neighbors. They are our friends. We are investing in increasing the amount of harm reduction supplies that are readily available, ideally 24-7. You know, I love our social service providers that operate here in this riding. Many of them close their doors Friday at five o'clock. Uh, and when are folks going to start using the recreational drugs? Just after that. 
And so we need to invest in organizations and partnerships that are providing services 24 seven. We're putting $300 million forward for that exact reason. Uh, we need to better coordinate our local service providers here to uh, work together to, uh, in this community, in this neighborhood, on this issue. And I think all three of us could tell you that this is deeply personal to us and we care very much about it. Excellent, thank you, David. Uh, can we take the next question over Zoom, Kais? Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm, I'm the Executive Director of Labor and Legal Services, which is the Community Legal Clinic that uh, provides services across downtown East neighborhoods in housing law, employment law, income security, um, immigration, human rights. And in 2019, we experienced a significant funding cut, but you probably know that the province cut legally by 30% that year. We're still feeling the impact of that. And so I'd like to know what the party's um, stances are on increasing legal aid. You probably know that um, over 50% of legal aid Ontario clients live with mental health and disability. So we've been talking about the rights of people with disabilities tonight. Um, also, Indigenous clients, although they represent maybe 3% of the Ontario population, they are disproportionately uh, users of legal aid Ontario services, like 14% of their clients. There have been a number of studies that show that for every $1 spent in legal aid funding, there's a knock-on uh, savings in other areas of, of social services, between $9 and $15. So it's, it really just strikes me from where I sit as poor policy to cut legal aid. When you think about access to justice, access to uh, the, the ability to name, claim, and blame uh, in order to assert your rights as a tenant, as a worker, um, as, as somebody seeking to reunite the family, um, or regularize your status. It's, it's, it's something that's really near and dear to my heart, and I would love to hear what the candidates have to, to say about legal aid funding. Thank you, Jenny. Um, we're going to go with Kristen first, and then uh, David, then Nikki. Go ahead, Kristen. David's first? Okay, David first. Go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for that question. You know, I, uh, we were at the 519 together when Ford's cuts to legal aid came into effect, and we immediately saw that with our clients. I'm looking over there. You're over here. Uh, that's where the sound was coming from. But... Uh, we felt that as well, and uh, so we as a Liberal Party are absolutely committed to restoring it. I do believe there's extra money there too, but I don't want to quote that in case I'm wrong. Uh, but in the example that I really felt and what I really saw as a huge uh, disappointment of the Ford government was the backing away from refugee claimants, because currently the federal government's focus is on convention refugees, and there's a lot of folks that are waiting for their applications to be processed, mm -hmm. and they've been left completely without representation under this government, and I think that's a real shame. So we will restore that legal aid funding. I, like I said, I want to say that there's extra money coming too, but I don't want to misspeak. So uh, thank you for that very, very important question. Excellent. Kristen, we're going to ask? Uh, thank you so much for that question, and uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, when the Ford government cut that 30%, we, we started to feel the ripples and we started to hear the stories right throughout our communities, especially when we were seeing tenants that were being bullied by landlords and rent evictions happening. Uh, this was uh, something that was dramatically uh, uh, jarring to many of our community members. Uh, the platform actually calls for the immediate restoring of the 30% and then expanding the in, um, the investments and legal aid. But it actually goes much further than that because we need to reform the system. The system in so many ways is actually rigged against those who are living in poverty. It criminalizes the poor. Oftentimes that are disproportionately impacted. Uh, those communities are BIPOC communities. So we have to take a look at this from a gender uh, as well as a racial and a social justice lens. Uh, so it's not just investing the money back into legal aid, which we absolutely will do, but it's also reforming the system so we don't have people falling through the cracks and then needing uh, legal aid, uh, which of course is very reactionary and the system is not designed to help you, it's designed to hold you down. Uh, so that's what the New Democratic uh, Party will do for, the, for, uh, for, uh, for those who need legal aid. Uh, and we'll work with legal aid providers so that we can um, so that we can also understand what the full-on uh, requirements are. And this, of course, means that we work with communities who are most deeply impacted, including people with lived experience. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Nikki. 
I'm just debating how much of my own life lived experience to reveal here. And I think in fairness, uh, I'm going to do that. In 2010, I, uh, because of uh, long-term oppression, my immune system shut down and I developed a tumor on my heart. That is extremely serious. It sounds pretty serious, it is. I applied for ODSP to live. I was being tossed out, made homeless. And they turned me down. Said I wasn't taking enough medications. Turns out that eating your own body weight in chemotherapy isn't enough because it was only one medication. A month later, I had $3,000 a month's worth of medication to deal with. ODSP turned me down because I wasn't taking enough medications. One out of 20% of the people that get the thing that I had die within three to six months. So I guess it wasn't a long-term problem as far as they were concerned. Too bad I outlived it. But without legal aid, without God bless you for the work that you're doing, I wouldn't be around today. Because this isn't for rich people, this is for poor people who have been screwed over by the government. And with people like your help, I went to the tribunal. We won my case, and I got enough money to stay in housing and to eat a meal that month. It's so important. And as you brilliantly brought up, it's an investment. A dollar in for $15 out. If you had a magic machine, anyone in this room, and I gave you a machine that for every dollar you put in, you got $15 out. My goodness, you'd be cranking the handle all day, wouldn't you? A magic machine where you put a dollar into legal aid and you get $15 worth of value back out of it. Now, that's not a tough sell if you pitch it in those terms and you don't demonize. Look, Doug Ford is not my favorite human being, but he understands a dollar in, 15 bucks out. Thank that you. can be pitched if we're smart about it, if we're even handed about it, and if we work across party lines, lines and don't engage in this partisan Thank you, Thank you Nick. Nonsense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to now take, we folks on the clap, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to now take questions from the audience, so go ahead. We'll take uh, a couple more questions. Go ahead, Ines. Whoever wants to, whoever's ready. Yep. The lady with the, go ahead, you first, yes. And then Ines, you want to go next? Welcome, my friend. Please introduce yourself, and thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Um, <laughs> things in many neighborhoods across Toronto Centre have uh, taken a dive in the last four years. Yeah. And I can personally say that um, I'm now starting to question my safety out and about at various times, including in the evening. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is what are each of you planning to do to improve safety in neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go uh, with the f with our first speaker. We're gonna go with David, and then we'll go on to Nikki, and then Kristen. Go ahead. I honestly can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> first. Yeah, she just went. Okay. So oh, I'll go first. You wanna I'll go, go first? first? Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. The question to, to rephrase is safety in our neighborhoods. I'll have a bash at this. The social contract is broken down, and folks don't feel safe on the street. I didn't used to know the difference between a firecracker and a gunshot, and now I do, and so do our kids. This isn't about being, ooh, I, this isn't about being a nervous Nelly. This is about facts. You know, people are getting shot in Toronto Center. That used to make the news. Now it's just, oh, did you hear about? Oh, where was it? Oh, it's a street up here. Another stabbing? No, the person got shot. Are they alive? Who knows? When did that become normal and okay? It's not normal, it's not okay, it's not. Now the fact of the matter is solving that is a multi, uh, it's not, if it was simple, we'd have done it already. But one thing we have to do is we have to figure out how to get proper bang for our buck out of our local police services. We have to find the correct balance between being locked up for being gay or lesbian and somebody walking around with a gun and it not being a big deal. I was out canvassing in, in the uh, northern part of the riding and I, we went past, a, 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 put it on Instagram, guns lying on the sidewalk, cops pulled them over, and they were just like, la-di-da, la-di-da, like this is no big deal. There's a lack of enforcement. Carrying a gun doesn't need to be made illegal. It's already illegal. You can't take a gun and point it at somebody else. It's against the law. Why isn't there more prosecution? I don't know. Somebody's asleep at the switch, and somebody needs to be there keeping people accountable. Thank you, Nikki. We're going to go with to David next and then Kristen. Yeah, thank you for the question, Sarah. I think it's, you know, 
very uh, present across this riding. Uh, you know, we talked about businesses in St. Lawrence are getting their windows smashed in. One of my staff was assaulted in the street the other day uh, just for walking around. Uh, and as Nikki mentions, we've had victims of gun crime here in this riding, uh, and it's just tragic. We are committed to banning all handguns in this province because I don't believe anyone, if you're not a professional, should have a handgun. That is part of our plan as a Liberal Party. And now if you can come on me with a little bit of a journey on this next one, I have been fighting very hard within the party and now I'm proud as part of our plan in ending exclusionary zoning because what I believe is fundamentally under the last 10 years, Toronto Centre has taken on a huge density of population where we filed people away and have given them no prospects of fitting into a community. And that has led to a rise in mental health challenges, it's led to a rise in crime, and as we built these towers, one after another, we boxed ourselves in and we didn't create communities. And so I fought extremely hard to get exclusionary zoning into our plan, ending that practice, because if we can build out across the city, into the missing middle, if we can create into uh, communities that are uh, with more density, we will address the issues that we're seeing today. This will take time, but it will work. And in 10 years, Toronto Centre will reap the benefits of it. Thank you. Kristen? Uh, thank you so much for that question. You know, interestingly enough, the social determinants of safety are exactly the same as the social determinants of health. Whether or not someone has access to housing, whether or not they have a pathway to education, if they have access to food, living a life free from discrimination and so forth. So if we're gonna want safer neighborhoods, we're gonna have to invest in its people. And of course, yes, we should ban handguns. Absolutely, we should do that. And of course, we need to make sure that we work in our partners who are on the ground, dedicated police officers who are patrolling our streets and not necessarily in, in, in patrol cars. But the, the, but, the, but the bottom line is that Young kids need access to recreation. People with mental health and, and addictions need access to care. We need to be able to provide opportunities for people to be successful so that they don't feel the sense of despair and being left behind. I'm, I'm small, I'm a, I'm a small frame Asian person. I'm five foot four and a half and I'll tell you that, you know, I don't want to live in fear. I don't want my son who, to, who's three years old to live in fear. And you know, this is a very deeply personal issue for all of us and I'm really glad we're having this conversation because it means that we're gonna have to make those deep investments. We're gonna have to do this as quickly as possible but this is something that cannot be grappled with by just one order of government. This is when every order of government and you and I need to raise our voices together as community so we can get the supports that we need and the investments that we need in Toronto Centre. So we're all safe and so we're all healthy. Yeah, it's kind of illegal. It's already illegal to do that. I mean, <laughs> prevalent, very prevalent. It's already illegal. It's already illegal to own a handgun. You can't make it more illegal. It doesn't make them any less dead. Clearly, that's not the solution. Excellent. So we're going to take another question from the audience. So, Ines, you want to you want to go? Go ahead, Ines. Just before you go next, we'll just have her go first. Okay. Go ahead. First, I'd like to say that I respect all the candidates. Uh, the answers are amazing, number one. Um, but, but I do live in the Moss Park area. And I do, same as Sarah, have safety concerns. And they're very deep-rooted. And I have my reasons, of course. I'm not going to waste time on all that right now. Um, <laughs> OK. But one of the things that I did want to uh, touch base on is the RGI. Um, I'm, an, I'm an example of that particular situation where I'm doing rent geared to income and I've been trying for a very long time now to get what others were getting on a flat rate basis that were just on ODSP or just on, on welfare system. Me, I'm, I'm complex because I'm a widow, so I have my CPP from my government, right. uh, uh, from my husband, which is a top up. And I have the um, CPP from my disability with the top up of ODSP. It's not a lot of top up. Uh, and it's really hard to budget based on that. So in my situation, and I know I'm not the only widow or widower out there that has these kind of situations that have happened. Um, what, what are we going to try to do based on a political 
level for someone like myself who's, in my opinion, I find that that wasn't fair. Um, I'm not saying the government's not fair, but it's just one of those situations that I've seen and uh, that's basically my question. But I did want to definitely agree with Sarah on the, the safety level because I do have that too. So uh, thank you. Uh, this question seems to focus on livability and safety. Uh, so if you could expand on that. And, and there what was we'll also do, I think, a, a component about the coordination of benefits. For of course, yeah. of course, we'll do that as well. So we'll start with David and then we'll go with Kristen and then Nikki. Go ahead, David. So um, I don't know your exact situation and how this would all shake out. What I do know is that, you know, you talk about government is fair. The problem is that government departments don't coordinate. Uh, and as people move from different ages, they age into different benefits, their situations change. So we are in our platform talking very actively about in anywhere where there's the Ontario jurisdiction, where we are responsible for that, whether it's, you know, you're graduating into 18 or you're turning 65, or if there's specific uh, additional benefit programs that you are uh, receiving, bringing that more into alignment and streamlining that uh, for you here. In terms of how that would connect to CPP, I will take that back. I will educate myself and learn more. Uh, I'm a humble enough guy to admit when I don't know every situation that a person might be in, but I will learn more about that and understand it better and see what we can do to work with our federal partners. You know, Marcy and I are, have a great relationship. We uh, talk all the time and we're committed to working together to make this riding better. So let me take that away. Thank you. Kristen? Um, Thanks so much for, for that question. And I think, you know, one way that I can try to answer it is to, to sort of talk about values. Um, you know, the value of the New Democratic Party and the proposition that's before us today is to lift every Ontarian out of poverty. And that means that we also need to reform this social safety net, which we all know that is broken. This is going to require people sharing their lived experience so we can understand what is wrong how do we fix it? How are those gaps or loopholes there? And then be able to help coordinate the different uh, programs so therefore you're not stuck in between places. And, and I'm really sorry to hear that that's what's happened. It, I can't imagine how frustrating that is. It's so unfair to you uh, because you shouldn't have to navigate that. The system should work for you and you shouldn't have to be working so hard to fix that. So we lead by stating what we want to do. And in this case, the, 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 the objective is clear. We want to lift every Ontarian out of poverty. We plan to do that within our first term. We plan to do that by doubling the ODSB rates, doubling the OW rates, indexing it to the rate of inflation, but also creating that action group that has lived experience, individuals telling us what needs to change, and then we follow your lead to make sure the legislative reform comes immediately afterwards. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Nikki? Okay, just a reminder, I am a person with a disability. I've lived on ODSB. I do understand clawbacks and, the, and how egregious they are. And now what that means is that you can get a dollar from the federal government, but they get it robbing Peter to pay Paul. And uh, uh, they penalize you for getting older or for being widowed. Uh, and they make you work twice as hard. I've got a note here, being poor is expensive and being out of work is a full-time job. You know what I'm talking about? Of course you do. Ask me how I know. Look, what we're talking about here doesn't require working parties. It just requires some smarts and some experience. In the regular insurance uh, industry, there's a word for what you're describing. It's called subrogation, S-U-B-R-O-G-A-T-I-O-N, subrogation. And it's how benefits are coordinated. Let's say you have two insurance policies. Oh, I don't know. One insurance policy with the province of Ontario and another insurance policy with the federal government. And how those benefits are coordinated is subject to law, the Insurance Act. But guess what? The government breaks the law all the time. And for people with a disability, that's highly problematic, not just because we die, because we can't get proper food, or because we can't get proper housing, but because it's against the law. See, we do have some protection under provincial, federal, and indeed under municipal legislation. It's called a duty to accommodate. You're not allowed to discriminate against people with a disability like you and I. It's against the law. It's not just wrong, it's illegal. And yet, I don't see the government being called to task on that, municipal, provincial, or federal. Thank you. To answer your question, that's what I would do. Point out 
the ugly truth. The carrot, it's good investment. The stick, it's against thank the you. law. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Ines? So my question is, living in housing, there is advantage and disadvantage. So the big problem is, when your rent, when your income increases, Utah housing, it takes one week for them to give you the new uh, 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 rent. But when your income goes lower, it takes them seven months to decrease your rent. And that's a problem because that happened to me. I had to penny pinch from everywhere to pay every month because my rent was higher than my income. Mm. How is it that this is gonna be with you guys to fix this matter? Because what the answer was given for me from TCAC was talk to the city. And that's a problem. Okay. And there's a lot of people in this community don't know how to advocate. I'm one of those, I know where to go and what to do. But there's a lot of people, and this is why po more poverty on top of poverty. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. We're going to go with Kristen first, and then we're going to go with Nikki and then David. Go ahead, Kristen. Uh, thank you so much, Ines, for that question. And, you know, I have shared those frustrations um, on many occasions simply because there have been a number of constituents who come to our office specifically telling us that TCHC was looking to make some adjustments with respect to the rent and it taking long. I don't know how many times we've had to intervene to make sure that people were able to navigate the system. Um, I'm starting to, actually not starting to, but I realize that part of the challenge, of course, is the confusion on how these things are regulated and, and the details of the regulations will sit within the social housing act which is a provincial body of legislation so we can mandate just like we can mandate that the type of service levels that you would expect a, uh, an elevator to have we should also be able to mandate that when it comes to social housing providers that they would be able to do and and perform certain mathematical calculations within a certain prescribed period of time so you're not stuck waiting chasing them seven months later for that rental adjustment downward when you've already shown them the proof of income to reflect the fact that your income Income has changed. So that is one thing that I would be very committed to doing is to reviewing the Social uh, Housing Act to make sure that it actually meets the needs today of the communities because that body of legislation has not been updated for some time. Awesome. Thank you. Um, has everyone answered it? I'm assuming everyone's no? Oh, I don't know. All right, well, everybody. thank you for that amazing question. And let's call it THCH, Toronto Housing. As I said before, the largest landlord in Toronto is Toronto. It is exempt from many of the rules governing other landlords, and it, it is a scoff law. It is quick, quick to penalize people. It is quick to punish people. And frankly, you know, the service standards for the Toronto Community Housing Corporation is a municipal responsibility, okay? It's not cool, and it's but one of the few things that we probably can't blame Doug Ford for. I'm appalled. The fact is, Toronto Community Housing Corporation needs to manage fewer housing. We need to have cooperative housing, which doesn't do the same thing because it's run by the members. It's very responsive. There's no calculation. Oh, my income went down. No worries. We'll just fix that out because the office to fix that is in the co-op house itself. You don't have to go up to some other place in heaven knows where. So the solution here, the long-term solution is participatory housing, co-op housing. The other solution is to make sure that, I hate to say it, but you know, at the municipal level, there should be some accountability there. You know what I'm saying? Like so. Yep. Not a smart answer. I mean, it's not a, a great answer, but unfortunately, the truth of the fact is that Toronto community housing is a law unto them or unto themselves. And the abuse they pour on people, the mental health crisis that they put people through all across Toronto, it's just shameful. Oh, I've got 10 Excellent. seconds? Great. I can trash talk, trash them a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, you, you live it. I've lived it. We know it. Co-op housing is a solution to almost all of the things we've heard tonight. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I think, are we done with answers? No. We're good. David, you want to go next? You know, it's, uh, Ines, I, that's, I've heard your situation at so many doors, uh, and I've heard of other situations where, you know, folks in currently in North Region in these uh, homes that are eventually to be demolished, they feel that they've been completely left behind by TCHC. You know, I think that uh, it is a Toronto-based organization. Our municipal leaders should be held accountable and should continue to advocate for that. We're going to have a municipal election soon, uh, and it will definitely be an important issue there. For me, what I want to do is make sure that we are infusing in our thought process concept of dignity in 
legislation, that we establish those standards that Kristen was talking about, that we look for opportunities to restore dignity, not just in THC, but in social services in general. Uh, because that's what I've heard from the service users. They feel like they're not being treated as humans, they're not being treated in a dignified way. And so I want to think about and imagine with all of you in this room, in the future, as we form government and we pass laws, how are we infusing this concept of dignity into these uh, laws? Because that's where the province plays the role, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you, David. So we have a room for one last question. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there's anyone uh, from the audience who would like to ask a question. Go, okay. Go ahead, Ibrahim Afra. Ibrahim, come on up. I uh, just want to say thank you for coming. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, not, I'm learning about politics and how change happens. Mm. And uh, there is this uh, documentary I watched. Uh, it was Frederick Douglass that brought healthcare to Saskatchewan and also to all Canada. So you promised a lot today. Uh, but what is one hard thing that you're going to deliver if you get elected? One very hard thing. Okay, we're going to start off with Nikki, and then we'll go to Kristen, then David. Go ahead, Nikki. Big question. It's worth thinking about, and it's worth giving a clear and unequivocal answer to, not a vague set of party platform promises. I'm going to cycle back a little bit and remember that this is Toronto Center. This is my home. This is not them. We're talking about we here. What are we going to do? We've got a lot of problems. And is it, you heard it? When you want to see the old show MASH? You deal with the thing that's killing you fastest first. And what is killing us fastest first? That's a pretty good question. It's an excellent question. I think it's poverty. I think it's the opioid crisis. I know it's housing. Putting them in the correct order and dealing with what's called the hierarchy of needs. The things that are killing us fastest are very, very basic. Food, shelter, human safety. And um, it's not a one answer. It's a great question. It's a very profound question. I'm very glad you asked it. But the number one thing I think on day one has to be establishing an order of operation. Ready, aim, fire. The order is important. We need to hit the things that are killing us fastest first. And that's not the perfect answer to your question, but I think it's the most authentic one I can give. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Kristen? Um, I, I really like that question. It's, it's actually a question that Councillor, then Councillor McConnell and I spoke about the answer to, to be quite honest, Deputy Mayor Pam McConnell. Uh, you know, God bless her and, and rest her. Um, when it comes to Toronto Centre's greatest needs, it's the alleviation of, of poverty and, and lifting a community out of poverty. This is something that Pam had spoken to me about. This is something that I also personally lived myself. I know that it made a huge difference having stable housing over my head, making sure that my parents were going to be able to provide care for us. And God forbid if one of them actually got sick, I don't know what we would have done. We, we barely made out of it. And so I would say that the one thing that I really want to deliver, and, and it, it is everything else flows from that, is to lift people out of their suffering, their, in, their, their punishing poverty. And that's something that I feel very deeply committed to. And it's very personal. And I never want to see anybody living in poverty again. And the NDP is committed to lifting every Ontarian out of poverty within our first term. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you want to go, David? Yeah, the complexity of the Ontario government, where you're a part of a team, you're a caucus member, you're maybe in government, maybe you're not in government. The one thing I can promise you is that I will be there and that I will be in this community. Yesterday, I took my one millionth step that I've taken since I started campaigning two months ago. And I have knocked on personally thousands of doors in this riding. And so the only thing that I can promise you is that I will be there and I will listen, that I'll be accessible, that I'll be accountable. This body, this energy, this time that I have invested without ever getting a dime, uh, with, I'm not elected, I haven't received any public funds. Mm -hmm. I have just done this because I believe in this community. And so you have all of this that I have to give to you uh, every day. And 
what that could turn into, if I am in the team, if we are in government, could be huge. It could tackle the issues of poverty. It could tackle the issues of housing. It could tackle the climate crisis. But I won't promise that uh, because I don't know what the outcome of this election will be. But I can promise you, you will have me. Thank you. Okay, my friends, we're done with the question and answer period. We're now going to take closing remarks. So I'm going to ask folks to be extra quiet and attentive. I know candidates put in a lot of heart in their closing remarks. So these are the final words before you make up your mind on which candidate and which party to support in the upcoming provincial elections. So Nikki, are you ready to start off with our closing remarks? How long do I have? You have about five minutes. Five minutes. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I love the silence for a moment. Been a lot of talk tonight. Firstly, I'm running for Toronto Centre. Yes, I'm with the Green Party of Ontario. But my boss isn't Del Duca or Horvath or even Mike Schreiner. My boss is you. I'm accountable to you. I'm accountable to the actions that you demand in the order in which you demand them. We have a great blessing in this, one of many great blessings in this riding of Toronto Centre. There's a reason the Conservative isn't here. It's not because they're unresponsive, or there might be a contributory factor. The fact is, it is mathematically impossible for a Conservative to win in this riding, even with a three-way race. So this riding, this special riding of Toronto Centre, is where your choice is one of conscience. There's none of this business with a strategic vote where you have to hold your nose and vote for one party or the other. You can vote for the best representation for Toronto Centre. And here is the thing. We may not know what is going to happen, but it's going to be one of two things. Version A, which we hope for, is a progressive coalition government led, and I mean this, led by the Green Party with the participation of the NDP and the Liberals. And I say that not because it's self-serving, although it obviously is, but because the Green Party of Ontario has consistently been the moral compass of all the governments that we've had at every level of government. We've found that it is much better to discover shared values common solutions, build consensus, that it is more effective to do so, and that we get positive action. Well, we don't engage in matches of one uh, leadership ego against another leadership ego and against another leadership ego. You know, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And that kind of bipartisanship is one of the reasons that Toronto Centre is in such a mess. Because when we constantly flip-flop backwards and forwards, and make it about ego and not solutions, we will lose. In Toronto Centre, that's version A, a coalition government. And you know we can work with the Liberals. Heck, we can work with the Liberals because they steal our best ideas. And God bless them. If only they put them into action, I wouldn't have to run at all. So we can work with the, uh, the Liberals of the NDPs. And yes, plan B, the F word. We can work with the F word, too. Plan B is where Ford wins in the rest of Ontario. Not here, not mathematically possible, but elsewhere. And we've demonstrated that by staying firm to our principles, using principle-based decisions, that we can shift even Doug Ford into different action. He suddenly discovered electric vehicles. Who do you think gave him that idea? Green Party and Mike Schreiner. Who, he's talking about the new climate economy. Who gave him that idea? Green Party. And that's okay. Because as others, others have not been, they've been, as my uncle would say, strangers to the truth. Being in opposition is still being part of the government. Criticizing government action is something that all elected people do. It doesn't have to be it can't it be destructive, it can be constructive uh, criticism, like making sure that legal aid, is, legal aid is covered because it's a dollar in and $15 out. It's a money-making proposition, and Doug likes money. 
or talking about uh, ODSP rates, making sure that it's governed under a single, manageable, intelligent system. Already one minute ago, we've got a five minute on this. Oh, okay. You can vote for Nikki Ward mm -hmm. and the Green Party of Ontario, and you can get the best of all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sacrifice your values. You don't even have to sacrifice the goals and ambitions of whatever particular party you follow on a normal every day. But this is not an everyday election. Plan A, vote for Nikki Ward. Plan B, vote for Nikki Ward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well said, Nikki. Okay, we're going to go to Kristen, then David. Go ahead. Um, thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for sitting through this really stimulating conversation. And I think it's such a critically important conversation because you can clearly see that all of us demonstrate our passion, including those who are watching online, their passion and love for Toronto Centre, uh, which I share in equal amounts. This election has so much at stake, and I think each and every single one of us recognize that the vote is important, but also what we stand for is really about what the community has been asking for. And those things include the need to build affordable housing, the need to reform long-term care, health care, education, making sure that kids, especially kids in Regent Park and families, have opportunities so that they can lift themselves out of poverty and we have seen that the problems that, that exist, not just in Toronto Centre, but right across Toronto and Ontario, have predated the pandemic. The pandemic made things worse and has shined a very large and bright light on all those social and health inequities. And in order for us to fix what's broken, we need to be able to address it with a sense of urgency. I'm very proud to be running for the NDP, and I'll tell you why. Right now, we hold 40 seats in government. We need 10 more in order for us to send Mr. Ford packing. And yes, the NDP has been its loyal opposition for the past four years, and it's actually been the NDP Toronto caucus in particular that I'm proud to now be a party of, because they have stood up time and time again to withstand the Ford cuts, the Ford downloading, the Ford weakening of our local democracy in Toronto. All these things would have actually gone through without a whimper or a whisper, without the NDP opposition. So there's much to be proud of, much that we've built upon, and we are the party that can actually send Mr. Ford packing. Last Sunday, I invited the Toronto caucus to come to 260 Sackville we stood on the rooftop of 260. We launched our Toronto platform, a 24-page document that outlines what we want to do to uplift the people and the residents of Toronto and Toronto Centre. As far as I know, we may be the only party that has a Toronto-specific platform. And that's because this city and this community is the economic engine, not just of Ontario, but actually Canada. We're the artistic and cultural hub we have to recover from the punishing pandemic that has been brutalizing so many in our community. Our small businesses have been suffering. Economic development opportunities have waned. We need to bring back tourism. We need to bring back life in the city as we know it. We need to make those investments in communities. And that's why I'm running. That's why I'm leaving City Halls, because I couldn't get to those solutions that we needed to get to because the person that fell down the stream actually fell down the stream upstream. And I want to know why they fell downstream. So those solutions are going to be at Queen's Park. You know that I am hardworking. You know that I am effective. I have delivered time and time again for our communities, despite the challenges that have existed in a 25-seat council at City Hall. With only one vote, I've created the Downtown East Action Plan. With only one vote, I helped create the world's largest indigenous incubator and accelerator for entrepreneurs. With only one vote, I was able to help transform the revitalization and the rebuild of Young Street, which will be complete in 2025. Can you imagine what will happen if I am your MPP, I get you and your families to come with me to Queen's Park, because do not leave me to do that work by myself. 
I've always, always wanted to do it with you, and I hope that I will have your support so I can continue that good work at Queen's Park. Thank you very much, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, we're going to now move on to David. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I, I'm in awe of Toronto Centre tonight, of the choice, the amazing choice of candidates you have ahead of you uh, for any party. Uh, I'm in awe of the questions that were asked tonight, of the, the forward thinking and the determination that this community shows every single day to rise up and build something better. And I have been so proud to stand with you and to do that. And you know, one thing that we haven't talked about, I think enough tonight though, is that we faced in this downtown riding a great affordability crisis. We see our cost of living going up, we see inflation going up, and I am proud to say that the Ontario Liberals are the only party on this stage though that is offering to make your home more affordable, to make your transit more affordable, to make your food more affordable, and to make your gas more affordable. We are the only party that is tackling these issues holistically, recognizing the complexity of your lives and recognizing the complexities of the challenges facing our economy today. We're the party that's committing not to just end not-for-profit long-term or for-profit long-term care, but actually putting money behind that promise and a clear timeline of having it done by 2028. We're the party committing to make the largest investment in home care so that seniors can age at home. And that's what I'm so proud of. Look at our platform, read it, read the housing section. It is so deeply thoughtful as we tackle the problem, not just with one simple promise, one simple slogan, but comprehensively, thoughtfully. That is what Ontario Liberals do. We are pragmatic progressives. We solve problems and we listen and reflect that back to you. And that's why I'm so thrilled to be a part of this team. I don't need to uh, you know, have all the answers myself. I have you and I have stakeholders and I have experts and I have evidence-based decision-making. That's what I will take with me to Queen's Park. That's what I'll use every day going forward as your representative. And as I answered in your question, Ibrahim, you will have all of me after this election. Thank you so much. Well said. Wow, what an amazing debate. Right? How did everyone enjoy it tonight? I'm seeing a lot of smiling faces. I can't look at Zoom, but I'm assuming they're as excited. Are there a lot of waves up and thumbs up on Zoom? I'm assuming. Awesome. Yeah, it will be live stream on YouTube, 100%. And I just let's give a hand of applause to um, my amazing co-moderator, Ina. Thank you, Ina. I also want to thank our amazing candidates, Christine Wong Tam from the NDP, <laughs> David Morris from the Liberal Party of Canada, Ontario, thank you. <laughs> Liberal Party of Ontario, <laughs> and Nikki Ward from the Green Party. You got it right at the end, Waleen. Good for you. <laughs> you know, it all comes back to circle, right? Um, and what I just want to say is thank you. Thank you for making this debate memorable. Thanks to the candidates for answering those amazing questions. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight and being interested in your government, in your provincial government, being civically engaged and holding our candidates accountable. Because what we want is not just to hear to commitments. We want accountability after our elections, right? And this is that process of accountability. Um, I want to also encourage all of you to download our Hello Neighbor app. So if you're going to be leaving here, there's a poster right there with a nice QR code. Just before you leave, download our Hello Neighbor app so you can find out more about the events and the programming and the initiatives that are happening in our beautiful community right here in Regent Park, in the heart of the city, in the beautiful riding of Toronto Center. So please, please download the app. The other thing is we want you to subscribe to RPTV, Regent Park TV. Shout out to Regent Park TV for making this possible, for covering it, for live Thank streaming you. it on YouTube. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, Adonis. Thank you, Dewar. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes. There's a lot of amazing staff at Regent Park TV. 
uh, focus on making sure that we're informed on what's happening in our community. And lastly, lastly, don't forget to vote. Don't forget to vote. You know, a lot of people come out to debates and sometimes they forget to vote. You can't forget to vote. You have to vote, hopefully in advance polls, which is starting this Thursday, right? So get out with your family, walk out on this beautiful sunny day and exercise your democratic right to choose your representative in government, a right that's been fought for by so many. So let's not forget those sacrifices. Come out and vote. So uh, I'm just going to take a quick selfie. I know we're going to end the programming. I'm going to take a quick selfie, but I'm going to encourage all of you to step <laughs> and forward and get to meet your candidate. Ask them questions you might have not had an opportunity to ask. And before we conclude, I want to thank Kais Ishmael, our Zoom moderators. Thank you so much for making it possible for many, many residents through Zoom to participate. So thank you. All right, my friends, we're done. Thank you. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And when you do subscribe, hit the little notification bell so you never miss out on any of our content. If you'd also like more, you can find us on our other social media platforms. And if you want even more, you can look at our website.